Hello and welcome to week one of Pub 502. This video lecture is going to be the first in our many weeks of video lectures, um, but it is also going to be a little bit different because we're going to do an overview of the class as well as get into some of our content. All right, so this week's lecture we're going to cover a lot of ground. First we're going to talk about the course overall. Um, we're going to then go into a discussion of public versus private management and talk about some of the reasons why they may differ. Now this will coincide with your reading this week, so it's going to play off of one another. I'm not going to go into every example given in the reading, um, but I might use others as well. Then we're going to have a discussion of our two readings outside of the uh, Public Administrator's Companion book, um, the Shalala reading and the Mintzberg reading. Um, and then we're going to discuss the article analysis assignment. So you can go ahead and make your selections and get going on that. So let's talk about the course and give you an overview first of the content of what we're going to cover throughout the semester. So the first section is going to be uh, on the theme of public management as different. And to the extent that it's relevant, that will just be public service or public employment as different as well. So we're going to talk about things like oversight from the public and press that might not happen in the same way in the private sector, stakeholders for public organizations, etc. We're going to get into that today, so no need to belabor the point. Section two is going to be a more um, broad discussion of leading organizations. So we're going to talk about things like organizational structure and culture, leadership and motivation, ethics and management, and change and innovation. There might be an o a lot of overlap here between public and private sector theories, but we're going to kind of illuminate the places where it is different and why it is different. Then we're going to talk about managing work and measuring outcomes. One of the things that used to be taught pretty heavily with this class that I think is good but in maybe a little bit of a different context is strategic planning and its role in the organization in terms of managing outcomes and having goals and, and setting them and all of that. Um, so we are going to go ahead and do a case exercise or a case study on strategic planning. Um, then we're going to do some nuts and bolts stuff with um, beyond the big picture with things like information security and management, um, privatization and contract management, and human resources and labor and employment law. This is the kind of thing that you probably have not talked a ton about in your other classes, or if you have, it's been tangentially and not head on. Um, but it is extremely important, especially for public sector managers to understand. And then we're going to wrap up by returning to the role of politics in public service and management. So a little bit about format. Uh, I think it's easiest to think about the class this way. We're guided by the week. So in the syllabus and the schedule part, you'll see week one, week two, week three, etc. Each week starts on a Monday and the content goes for the entire week. When you view the lecture, when you take the reading quiz, when you do get the reading done, that is up to you as long as everything is done by the following Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Now there are some exceptions from that, so you should look through the syllabus, and we're actually going to look through the syllabus together, so to speak, um, in a moment, and, and I'll try and highlight as many of those as I can. That means there is no type of mandatory class meeting, whether that's virtually or in person. However, as I'll talk about in a second, we do have some optional live sessions. Um, lectures are posted on Blackboard on Mondays. Um, this is usually true with a few exceptions. Um, and assignments are due the following Sunday. Again, usually true with some exceptions. The main thing you'll have to remember every week that is going to be pretty regular every week is the reading quizzes. Most weeks have a short reading quiz about the readings. This covers all the mandatory readings, um, not the suggested ones. And so um, we'll talk about the reading quiz a little more in a minute, but that's the one thing outside of the lecture and the readings. The reading quiz is going to be regular every single week. 
Now, I did mention that there are some optional live sessions, uh, both virtual in per and in person. This is the first time I'm doing this with an online class, but I'm doing it for two reasons. Um, one is I think some of this content benefits from live, and I say that, discussion, um, knowing that some of that discussion will be done through the computer. I think posing questions in real time and thinking about them in real time has some value here. We are going to have one in-person section, or session rather, um, to talk about the strategic planning case study because that one is so heavy. Um, I want to do that in person. Um, and so that date is on the syllabus. Now the first live session is this week um, on the 4th at 8.30 p.m. Quite frankly, it's at that time because that's the time our class used to meet. Also, it's about the time my kids decide to go to bed um, if I haven't decided it for them long before that. Um, and I know a lot of you have kids and other obligations as well. This should um, allow you the time to set the DVR, get the kids in bed, get dinner out of the way, all of that stuff, and still make it for um, a virtual session. When I say virtual session, you'll kind of see what I mean this week if you quote unquote attend. Um, but it will be me talking live. You can show up video wise or you can turn your camera off and sit there in your pajamas. I don't care. Um, but you will be able to ask and answer questions in real time and all that stuff. Um, there might be a few kinks the first go round, um, but we will do our best to get through those. Um, and they are all listed on the syllabus. So my suggestion to you in terms of how to get this material in is to do the reading first, then watch the lecture and reread if necessary, then go do the reading quiz. Now when I say read first, I fully understand that you're not going to capture all of the, the content out of each reading that I want you to get the first go round. The same is true of class. I wouldn't expect you to come to class and know everything um, in a traditional lecture style class. So I don't expect that the first time you watch the lecture either. However, what I do expect is between the reading, the lecture, and then going back and kind of filling in the gaps, that you're able to do the assessment. Um, and the assessment in this case is the reading quiz. And then um, we'll talk about these case studies in a minute, but instead of exams, um, because I don't like them, we have four, four case studies that act as our exams throughout the semester. So kind of key concepts will be dealt with in a case study format so that you come away with some practical experience um, while still being able to delve into the theoretical as well. So I have the syllabus here and we're going to go through a few of the key things together. Um, most importantly, I know students want to know how they're graded and I don't blame you. Um, the grading is explained in the syllabus. I'm going to go over a few key features here and talk a little bit about the schedule and things of that nature. Um, so as you can see, there are four video submissions, the first one of which is due this week. These are prompts that would otherwise be a discussion board, but are done a little bit differently. There's a sample up for you. It's very low tech. I don't expect you to be high tech. Um, you can, if you want, to do other things. Um, I just expect that it's original content. And when I say other things, I know there's um, online software that allows you to make little cartoons. Um, or essentially talking comic strips. Um, you can do that. Um, I would ask that you not do that for all of them, but honestly, we just kind of want to see each other's faces and check in um, on content. Um, all of these, except for I think one of them, has a three to five minute um, guideline with five minutes being a limit. I am going to stop watching after five minutes. Don't put anything after five minutes. Now, my sample that I put up today for the uh, article analysis video, which is very similar in nature, follows the three to five minute rule, is four minutes and 59 seconds, and by gosh, I'm sticking by it. Um, as I mentioned, there are four case study assignments. Those um, are filtered throughout the semester, and they touch on different um, really key topics for us. So when you look at the schedule, and I encourage you to print a color copy because I have color coded it, I didn't because my printer at home is not color, um, at least not the one that I can get to right now in the process of moving. Um, but they are color coded and you'll see on here when there is a case study assignment. The case study assignments will come um, kind of, as I mentioned, with some key features of our 
um, study here. The first one is about stakeholders. We'll be doing a stakeholder assessment um, and analysis. Um, the second one is, there we go. It starts on the 21st. It's handed out then. Um, we'll also have a virtual meeting that week um, to kind of cover that. I try and key those in when we can. And that'll be about change and motivation and leadership. Uh, the third one is the big one. This is the um, strategic planning case study. Essentially what we're going to do um, is kind of analyze what you would do to engage in a strategic plan in a very specific setting. Um, and then finally, the fourth case study is um, is done as part of uh, the Human Resources and Labor and Employment Law. Um, we're going to be talking about a hiring and ethics type question. Um, so those are the case studies. Again, I encourage you to print this or save it. If you save it, it'll be color, but if you print it, it'll be color. That'll be better. Um, so that brings us then to a couple of other things. There's the bias and privilege analysis. This one is not a video. This is simply um, kind of a, a reflection paper. We'll talk about more um, content-wise why I'm having you do this, but I did want it to be something that wasn't video that was um, kind of analyzing in writing with thought um, and kind of going through and, and planning it out carefully. Then we have the book analysis and article analysis. The book analysis and article analysis are very similar um, in some ways and different in one key way. Um, actually, two key ways. One's a book, one's an article. So I'll skip. I'll do the article analysis and then we'll come back to the book analysis. Each student will pick one article from the suggested and reported reading. So if you look at the schedule, and you see, I'm looking at week six here. It has mandatory readings and then suggested reported readings. These ones under suggested and, and reported readings are available to choose from to do your article analysis. Now, only one student per article. There are far more articles than there are students in this class, so that should not be a problem. Um, there is a Google sign up, so you will submit your top three choices and I will then provide um, a list back as soon as that deadline has passed and I posted the deadline um, on Blackboard so you can see it there. I believe I asked you to submit that by I think Wednesday or so. Um, so go through, look at the article, see what interests you. What you'll have to do is a one-page memo, which is a summary, and I've provided instructions later on about that, and then a three to five minute video in which you'll explain it, and I've produced a sample video from one of our readings this week. The book analysis is very similar, except obviously it's a book, difference one. Difference two, though, is I want you to be thinking very critically about the book. Some of them I have included knowing full well that you might tear them apart. Um, you might say this, you know, this doesn't apply to the public setting or it's not very realistic. All of them are kind of books that um, have been used in a variety of ways, either to teach something like crisis management, um, leadership, time management, organizational culture, teamwork, all of those things. And some of them are kind of pop culture -y books, like you may have heard about them or you may even read, have read some of them. Um, so I think that there's a lot to be gained from all of these books. I don't think that they're free from criticism though. So the book analysis memo is going to be a little bit longer um, and we'll talk about that more as it becomes closer. You have pretty much the entire semester to do it. Um, we'll sign up for the books because again only one student per book. Um, next week, so you can look over the books, you can pull them up on Amazon or the library and see you know, how long they are, how much they are, if you want to buy them, that kind of thing. Um, the book analysis memo and video are not due until December 1st, so you have the whole semester to do it. Essentially what we're doing with the book analysis and article analysis is we're creating, um, as a group, um, we are creating a library of information. And what I want you to think about is the way in which we are teaching each other some of this and the way in which we are incorporating this into the larger structure of the course. Finally, then, there are the reading quizzes. I said I would talk about this more. You are graded on 10 of them. Right now, there are 12 available. So, uh, if you can do the math, you're graded on 10, you can do one of two things, or a combination, I guess. You can take 10 
and stop and just be happy with whatever grade you have. Um, or you can take all 12 and take the extra credit. It's up to you. Um, I think there are benefits and drawbacks. You just skip to, you know, you might have weeks where it doesn't make sense for you to worry about the reading quiz for whatever personal reason. I understand that. That's why I built in a little bit of flexibility. So you're graded on 10, 10 points each, 100 points total, but there's 120 points really available out there. That brings us to expectations. I spell these out pretty uh, clearly, I think, in the syllabus. Um, but I do expect some, I think, very important things of you, and I also lay out what you can expect from me. Your expectations of me. Um, I will provide you with the course content and the framework. I will make time for you outside of class. A couple of key notes here. Um, I do ask that for email you give me at least 24 to 48 hours to respond um, between the three classes I teach and um, the directorship for the MPA program. I get a lot of emails and so it usually takes me at least that long to get back to you. I try and do them as quickly as possible. Um, but there may be reasons why I have not. As I say in the syllabus, if you have not heard back from me in 72 hours, go ahead and resend it, forward it, just saying, hey, I'm not sure if you saw this email. Um, I may have, you know, and I may have thought I responded. A lot of times I'll kind of bookmark them or start a response and then never finish it or it doesn't send properly. Again, hopefully not as much of an issue with Gmail as it was with Outlook, but um, just go ahead, 72 hours, resend it, um, and go from there. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, I do have my Twitter handle there, and I do have office hours that are on the syllabus, and also now through the magic and miracle of Google calendars, um, you can set an appointment with me during my office hours, um, and if you look on the syllabus and on Blackboard, there are, are links to do that. I will answer your questions, I will return work within a reasonable time, and I will make this course worth your time. I think you're going to pick up a lot of good information in this course, um, and so putting the work in means you'll get that much more out of it. All right, final, final kind of uh, housekeeping slide here. Technological requirements specific to this course. Um, there are kind of some specific things you'll need because this is an online course. You're going to have to have accessible internet um, available to you, you know, outside of having a computer at home um, or a tablet or whatever you end up using. You also have the, the computer lab available to you. So um, there really is not a reason why you should not have availability technologically, but I do understand that it, it's worth noting that you should have a computer or access to that. Um, video posts will require you to have some way to capture your image or um, somehow project an image <laughs> into the discussion board. Now this does not have to be high tech. Um, for my videos, I use my laptop's camera. I probably should get a better one, um, but that's what I use for now. It seems to work okay. Um, you can use your phone. You can use a, a standalone camera that takes video. Whatever it is that you can record, save, and upload to Blackboard, um, that's what you need to have. Um, and then word processing and PDF capability. All right, so we are at the point at which we have probably hit or are coming very close to that 20 minute mark that I said I try and keep my lectures around. I have some good news and some bad news. One is that one of these slides entirely is going to be skipped coming up because it is the sample for your article analysis. So I'm going to save ourselves a little bit of time that way. Um, the bad news is that we still have some information to cover, so this video probably is going to be a little bit longer than, um, than my normal goal post. Um, so, the first thing we're going to talk about, and a theme that is going to stay with us throughout this semester, is that the public versus private dynamic here whether it's an employment or management, um, is really important to understand. And it's important to understand because it's going to change how you manage your workforce, it's going to change how you manage your projects, and it's going to change who you are accountable to and how you are accountable to them. So this theme is important, it sticks with us, we do not kind of leave it behind in the dust, but let's 
talk about this a little bit. I think your um, the textbook, The Public Administrator's Companion, which, by the way, I choose this book because it is kind of a quintessential put it on your bookshelf and then when you forget how to do SWOT analysis or you want to look at measurement, whatever it is, you can kind of pull it off. There's a couple of budgeting chapters that we don't necessarily use in this um, situation, but it's a great reference. Anyhow, um, that the chapter one that is assigned for this um, this week does a really good job of going over some of this. So I'm not going to repeat what it says. What I am going to do, though, is kind of hit the highlights and maybe add a little bit. So what we have to think about here is really a compare and contrast. What is different? What is the same? Um, and there are some similarities and there are some key differences. And part of that is due to the fact, and we'll deal with this in real depth in a couple of weeks, that public and private entities have different stakeholders. And stakeholders meaning people who have interest in the success and sometimes failure of an organization. Now, we can broadly say, well, the public has interest in large corporations' success um, or maybe in their failure in certain ways, but not in the same way um, that they have interest in either government organizations or non-governmental organizations that are seen as public. And, and this I'm using nonprofits in here in particular, but also healthcare organizations as well. Um, so the stakeholders change and their expectations change. And even the same person who sits, let's say it's a board uh, member, same person sits on a board for a nonprofit and sits on the board for a for-profit institution. They should expect different levels of care and concern for different issues when they go to different board meetings. That is not unreasonable. It's not unreasonable for them to grant maybe a little bit of leeway to a public organization where they wouldn't from a profit generating organization and vice versa. Um, so the stakeholders change. The resources change. Think about it this way. There are big fish and there are little fish, right? The big fish, if we're talking um, public, is obviously the U.S. government. That's the biggest fish of them all. That's the one with the most resources. Um, you know, we can talk about debt and deficit another day over coffee if you'd like. Um, but really, the U.S. government has a somewhat um, limitless level of resources to do its work. Now, there are big fish in the, in the um, private pond as well. There's Apple, there's Google, there's Facebook. Um, there are these big organizations that do not need to rely on um, the public in the same way that smaller ones do. But we shouldn't go comparing, let's say, Google to the city of Flint, nor should we compare the U.S. government to let's say, the, the uh, Steady Eddie's Cafe at Flint Farmer's Market. The resources are different, but the resource constraints are also different. How you get your money is very different in a public organization, um, in the public sector, um, and how much money you can make um, and how much money you can retain year over year differs. Um, expectations. As I, and I think I mentioned this a lot with stakeholders, but just as a general public expectation, we expect public organizations um, to act in a way that is essentially a step or two above private organizations. We think it's a good idea when Google takes on some sort of um, champion cause, like putting Google Fiber in areas that don't have broadband access currently, that type of thing we don't necessarily expect it from them. That said, there is an expectation level for public organizations, whether that's government or nonprofits, that is very different. It's heightened in many ways. At the same time, there's not the expectation that you make profit there. So it's a different set of skills, a different set of expectations that go along with them. The role of the public. And I think our Mintzberg reading does a really good job of talking about this. Chapter one in PAC, Public Administrator's Companion, does a good job of talking about this. Um, the role of the public changes. And the role of the public, again, can be one person. I am the person, right? I am a consumer. I have an iPhone. So I am a, um, I am a consumer of a good from Apple. 
I also am a client, and I think the Mintzberg reading does a good job of this, um, for certain professional services, right? Um, for example, as I think I've mentioned, we're getting ready to move in, so that involves mortgages and all of that. I am a client of a mortgage company. Um, and then I am a citizen and I am a resident, and I have different expectations of government um, in that role, and I have different input levels in that role. I can go to public meetings, I can make my voice heard to elected officials as well as bureaucratic and non-elected civil servants. So the public has a different level of input and output um, in each type of organization. Political pressures, sure. We can think about the ways in which for-profit organizations have political pressure put on them or the ways in which um, they exert political pressure. But let's be honest, when we're talking about public sector entities, the name of the game at the end of the day is always, always going to be politics. Mintzberg talks about this, Shalala talks about this, our readings throughout the semester will talk about this. We cannot forget that the will of the people is done through the political sector and that policy implementation on the ground is what public ad, um, administration is all about. We are the ones who carry out the policy that is set at a legislative and electoral level. So that being the case, we have to understand then um, that the political pressures change based on who's been elected or who's been taken out of office. They change based on things like here in Michigan where we have um, uh, ballot initiatives or bond issues, millages, that kind of thing. There are political pressures that are different for public organizations. And they're not just different, they're integral. They are kind of the lifeblood of public organizations in a way that private entities, um, and I'm using private including publicly traded, but private entities or for-profit entities do not have to consider. And this then involves the role of elected officials. Um, if you work, for example, in a county clerk's office, that person who is at the top of the food chain is an elected official. Um, and their boss, if you're in a county that has a county executive, might be an elected official as well. Um, and so the political pressures are one thing, but this is an electoral pressure too, because there might be decisions made that are not in the best interests of the organization, but are done for um, re-election purposes. Um, and understanding that and trying to see the opportunity in that um, is what sets apart good public managers from the rest. And then finally, the charge. The charge meaning what is the organization's goal. Google might have lofty visions of what it sees its role in society being, but at the end of the day, government and the entities that have public service at their heart, they are given power from people. They are not just creating power and money and wealth on their own. They are given power from people. And as a result, the charge is to do good and to do the work of the people, right? Those aren't just empty words in the Constitution. That should be our goal and our mission of the people. And so because the charge is different, it's not just, oh, we have a charitable giving division. This is the charitable giving. This is the work of the people. And so the charge, the mission is different. So again, chapter one does a really good example of giving examples, definitions, discussion of all of the above. I think understanding kind of these key terms now is going to set you up for success throughout the semester. Again, I'm going to skip the Shalala reading. You, so you can find that five minutes, or excuse me, four minutes, 59 seconds on the discussion board. Um, but you can use this slide um, to guide that as well. I think what Mintzberg adds to our, um, our knowledge here is that the role in society for these different types of organizations um, plays into kind of our knowledge of capitalism and our understanding of how money is made, 
versus how government works. Um, I like the term non-owned organizations, right? Because it kind of captures the for-profit world in a different way. Um, it's saying that the for-profit world is owned, right? You either have shareholders that have stocks or you have a single entity or a partnership or something, right? Where they own the organization. There is no ownership of the county clerk's office. There is no ownership even of a nonprofit organization. Um, the ownership is much broader than that because the ownership is shared among citizens who have maybe no contact with that entity whatsoever. And I think what Mintzberg really contributes here, so his discussion here is going to be key, is the difference between customers, clients, citizens, and subjects. Um, and understanding this is where a good public administrator, a good public manager, separates themselves from the pack. Because that leads you right into the next thing. You cannot read a business book or take a business management class and expect to apply those same principles wholesale to the public sector. It is not going to work. And I would argue in many ways people that treat healthcare like a private or what uh, uh, Mintzberg would call owned organization are going to find some of the same failings as well because healthcare is so entrenched in our public service sector. Principles of management from business tend to fail for a few different reasons, one of which is they don't have the same charge at heart. And so some of the kind of key factors change, right? We don't talk about the politics in the same way. We don't talk about the role of elected officials in the same way. We also don't have customers or clients. We have citizens. And I think in the healthcare context, the, the notation of someone as a patient versus a customer or client is very important as well and, and kind of echoes this same principle. So I would when you're reading through this, really hone in on that discussion of customers versus clients versus citizens versus subjects and how that makes principles of business management fail. But I think what this comes back to, and this is a really good kind of starting point for thinking about the rest of the semester, is how can you reconcile the lessons from business management with the realities of public service? And maybe, and I and I really stress this, I think more uh, business um, leaders should look at what is being done in public service because there's innovation in public service that does not exist in the private sector. Um, I think one of the things you'll have to fight back um, constantly as someone who works in public service is the notion that um, public service is, um, it's old, it's, it's, you know, prehistoric, we don't move, we don't innovate, we don't change, and that simply cannot be further from the truth. In fact, when resources are constrained, public entities still have jobs to do, and so you might see some of the greatest innovation, for better or worse, in public organizations. Um, so how you can reconcile the lessons from business management with the realities of public service, and maybe how private or non-owned, or rather owned entities can learn from public service entities. All right, so a few key points as you move into the article analysis assignment. All of you will have a different due date for this. The overview here is that each student is providing a three to five minute video and a one page summary memo on an article from the suggested or reported readings of our syllabus and a separate le um, list is also provided. You will sign up for this article this week, please do this. If you, if you fail to do anything else, don't let it be this. Um, there is a link to a Google form where you select your first, second, and third choice, um, and then you go about your merry way. I, it is my goal to get everybody their first choice, but obviously people may have similar first choices. How should you make that choice? Well, what is an area of interest to you? Um, you can look at the articles. Um, some, some of them are not up yet, so um, you can pull them up through the library, most of them, though. I'm working on getting all of the content up this week. Um, some of them aren't up, but most of them are findable through Google Scholar uh, um, or that kind of thing. But you can also just kind of look at the title and where it's placed in the syllabus and think, okay, is this something that is going to be of interest to me? Um, the memo, one page, seriously, just one page. 
Um, I'm not even giving you guiding questions. What I am telling you is, assume that I am your superior, and this article is going to aid in our management of the business, and the business being a public one, how should I interpret this article? What, what do I have to gain here? Um, so you're going to want to talk about kind of the main theme, the key points of evidence, key connections to material and other readings in the course, and kind of the main takeaway. The video is a summary of the memo. So if the memo is one page, you're summarizing even further. This is going to get us into the fine art of distilling things down. So many of your classes I know are, hey, can you get to 10 or 15 pages? And there's a reason why. This is the opposite of that. There is not a lot of time to get to 10 or 15 pages when you're managing a public um, sector workplace. So your video should act as an elevator pitch or maybe a coffee or water cooler pitch. Assume you have three to five minutes with someone who needs to hear about this article. What is the summary? What do I need to know? Do not go more than five minutes or I start docking points um, and I really will stop watching it at five minutes. Both elements are due the Monday by the week the article is assigned. So, for example, next week, and I'm assuming probably no one's going to sign up for the articles next week, but there are articles next week if you want to get it out of the way. Next week, uh, there are two suggested and reported readings, and they are already up on Blackboard, so you can look at those. If you choose one of those. You would need to post them no later than 9-9 at 11.59 p.m. I post everything Sunday night, or at least that is my goal um, for the vast majority of our lectures and readings and all of that. You have until Monday night. But the reason it needs to be there is because we are creating kind of this quilt of knowledge um, throughout the semester from everybody. So it does need to be there um, pretty, pretty quickly. Um, the memo and the video go up together on the article analysis discussion board thread. You can post together um, and use the title like I put it here and you'll also see my example. On the example, I did not post a sample memo. Um, I think that by now in your careers you can do a sample, you can do a one page memo without a sample um, and you can hit the key points in an article. Um, the video I know is something a little bit different and unique to this class, so that's why I posted the sample there for you. One of the other things I have done for both this and the video submission, that is, there is one of those this week, is to post a sample video of how you actually post a video. Watch that. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Three hours later. 37 minutes. I'm going to try and keep this under 40. You can split it up into two or however you like. Um, key takeaways, read the syllabus, go through it. There's a lot of stuff I did not put on here, accommodations, etc. all of that on the syllabus. I'm going to hold you to the syllabus, not just to the video. Um, content wise, make sure you go through the readings. The reading quiz will be up by Wednesday um, and you will be able to take that then. Other key things to do this week, article selection, introduction video two things that are very important. Do that this week, get them submitted, um, and go through there. I'm going to then leave you um, with a closing thought, which is um, take a breath. It's going to be a lot this semester. Um, I know a lot of you have not taken an online class before. Um, we are going to go at a pace that I think will be comfortable. Um, and we're going to have those virtual sessions. I hope to see you all Wednesday night virtually. Um, and other than that, we'll talk soon.